So fr first, let me review uh, very briefly uh, the, in a sense, what was the end result of the lecture on Friday. So one thing we ended up with was the action for the chern simons theory in three dimensions with n equals two supersymmetry coupled to matter. So let me just write it down again to remind you what it was. So this is uh, the n equals two chern simons theory in three dimensions coupled to matter just in components. It's given by k over four pi times the chern simons action for the gauge field, which is plus the usual matter couplings. And then various terms which came from integrating out the fields in the vector multiplet that became auxiliary fields. Where's the picture? So, so here we imagine that we have some non-abelian gauge group. Um, Little a is the gauge index. T a are the matrices associated to that gauge symmetry. I is some flavor index, and T a is the matrix in some representation that the matter lives in. And you get some potential of this kind. So this is this uh, sextic bosonic potential that we derived on Friday, and it's coupled to the psi's, which are the fermionic partners of the phi's. Those are the chiral multiplets. And the der derivatives are, of course, covariant derivatives. In the n equals 2 uh, Yang-Mills theory, coupled to matter in three dimensions, there is a scalar in the vector multiplet, a real scalar, which you can think of as coming from the dimensional reduction of the third component of the gauge field in a four-dimensional theory. When we added the churn simons term, that just became massive. And when we integrated it out, it resulted in some of these couplings that appear on the board here. So I think this formula is already in the notes, just to recap what we did. And then towards the end of yesterday, I spoke about the case with more supersymmetry. So that's the n equals 2 action. And you can also add to it an arbitrary n equals 2 superpotential. Without the n equals 2 superpotential, the n equals 2 theory is superconformal, uh, and no superpotential will be generated. But if you add some random superpotential, it won't be superconformal anymore. And in general, the operators will have to have some anomalous dimensions. But in the special case where you have the start with the yang mills theory with n equals 4 supersymmetry, then you can add a chern simons term so that you only break supersymmetry down to n equals 3. So if you remember the n equals 4 theory, the n equals 4 yang mills theory in three dimensions, which is like the dimensional reduction of n equals 2 in four dimensions, had in the vector multiplet an additional adjoint chiral field, which I called, well, so the vector multiple, the, the n equals 4 yang mills in, in three dimensions, the n equals 4 vector has the gauge field, it had the field that we called sigma in the n equals 2 vector multiplet. It's a real scalar. And then it also has an additional uh, chiral, I mean, th this is just the bosonic fields, an additional complex scalar in the adjoint, which um, I'll call straight phi to distinguish it from these curly phi's. So there are three of these. These things transform in the three of the one of the SU2s of the SU2 cross SU2 R symmetry of this n equals 4 theory. Once you add the chern simons term, it's impossible to preserve the whole SU2 cross SU2. It's broken to the diagonal supersymmetry, which was originally in the vector of the SO4. So in the 2 comma 2 of the SU2 times SU2, gets broken to the 3 of this SU2 diagonal. And that's the our symmetry, which rotates these three real scalars. So this is complex. This is real. These are all in the adjoint. And this, there's a term in the, so just in the yang mills theory, there's terms in the superpotential which couple this field phi to the hypermultiplets. So the rest of the matter field has to appear in, in hypermultiplets, which 
in the most pedestrian understanding, are just conjugate pairs of chiral multiplets. So there's some fields phi i and phi i tilde with opposite charges in conjugate representations. And there has to be coupling in the superpotential, which is so the supersymmetry. So this field phi also couples to, this field sigma also couples to the matter fields exactly in the same way that the field A couples and covariant derivatives. That's just because in N equals two theories in three dimensions, this is just coming from the dimensional reduction of one of the components of the gauge field in four dimensions. So in this N equals four supersymmetric theory, this also has to have analogous couplings, and those turn out to sit in the N equals two language in the superpotential. So there's some terms of the form um, phi i tilde that phi, phi i, contracted appropriately. Um, so this is in the adjoint, and this is, say, in the fundamental representation. So there's some term in the superpotential like this. And then we talked about that in the Chern-Simons theory, you can add an n equals 2 Chern-Simons term. Of course, that would break supersymmetry all the way down to n equals 2. But if, in addition, you add a superpotential, an n equals 2 superpotential given by minus k over 8 pi, integral of trace phi squared. So this k has to be the same k that appears in this Chern-Simons theory, so the level of that Chern-Simons theory. Then you'll not break all the way down to n equals 2, but you'll still preserve that SU2 diagonal. You'll have n equals 3 supersymmetry. And so this field phi also becomes massive. In the infrared, as we discussed, the Yang-Mills kinetic term becomes an irrelevant operator. This gauge field becomes a John Simon's gauge field. You throw away its Yang-Mills kinetic term. These uh, matter fields become massive, and in the infrared, you just integrate them out. So integrating out this guy produces this potential. Integrating out this field phi produces a, a super potential. So In the infrared, you just get the Trent-Simons matter theory without the Yang-Mills term, and you end up with an n equals 2 superpotential given by 4 pi over k, phi i tilde. Now, Ta is the same matrix. It's the matrix of the gauge group. A is the gauge group index. So if you know, T was in the fundamental representation, this would just be contraction, obviously, like this. OK, and so this superpotential, you can work out how it would appear in the bosonic potential, and it will give you another term, for instance, in the bosonic potential, very similar to this one, which makes the bosonic potential invariant under the remaining uh, SU2 R symmetry. So this thing has n equals 3 supersymmetry and an SU2R symmetry, which is the diagonal inside of the one that you had in the pure yang mill theory. For yang mills without Chen Simons. OK, so that's about where we got to um, Friday. Now, we discussed, the, I discussed in the n equals 2 case the, how the renormalization, or the fact that this theory is super conformal, that no terms can be generated in the superpotential, that some terms can be generated in the Kähler potential, but they're all irrelevant operators except for the one which is just the multiple of the canonical one. And so it can be reabsorbed as a rescaling of the field. It's a wave function renormalization. And indeed, in these n equals 2 churn simons theories, the chiral multiplets will get anomalous dimensions in the infrared, um, which you can compute in perturbation theory in 1 over k, for instance. So if k is very large, the effective coupling of the theory is 1 over k, and it's very weakly coupled, and you can compute the anomalous dimensions in perturbation theory. So now in this n equals 3 situation, uh, things are, are somewhat better. So the, first of all, the, you know, there's a non-abelian R symmetry. And so the representations, so different operators will sit in representations of the R symmetry. Those representations have to be the same in the infrared and the IR 
at least. So if you have a U1R symmetry, as you do in an N equals 2 theory, you may have a different U1R symmetry in the UV theory and in the infrared theory. It's easy to continuously rotate abelian gauge groups, and the representations of abelian gauge groups will also rotate in this way. On the other hand, if you have non-abelian gauge symmetries, if you try to have a different R symmetry in the infrared and the UV, it means that you have to continuously rotate this non-abelian group. The only way that could happen is if it sits inside of a larger group, which is also non-abelian. So that situation almost never arises, but we will mention one example which actually has a very large R symmetry group. And then the, the S2 in the infrared and the IR could be different. But if that doesn't happen, which is what's the standard case, then the dimensions of operators in the UV and the infrared have to be the same. And so these, the matter fields, these phi's, have dimension one half, and so on. So there are no, no anomalous dimensions. And in this n equals three Chern Simons matter theory, you can see that there are just no marginal or relevant operators you can add at all, which preserve the n equals three supersymmetry and the SO3 R symmetry. You can't even adjust the coefficients. If you try to adjust the coefficients, you'll break supersymmetry. So you'll never uh, renormalize any part of this, of this action. So for instance, if you look at the superpotential, you can just check that it, it's impossible to add other terms that don't break from n equals three supersymmetry down to n equals two. And so you won't generate such terms. OK. Um, So it was thought for a long time that it was impossible to have Chern Simons matter theories in three dimensions with more supersymmetry than n equals three, because we saw that if you start with the Yang Mills theory with n equals four and you add the Chern Simons, you break it to n equals three. But it turns out that once you flow to the infrared and the Yang Mills uh, part of the Lagrangian has been removed, it, the Yang Mills coupling flows to infinity and you simply erase this operator. It's an irrelevant operator in the IR theory, then it is possible to have more than n equals three supersymmetry. So that's a, an involved story, so I won't get into it too much, but I, I want to tell you about a particular theory with n equals six supersymmetry. Uh, but just to give you some idea, there are theories, trans, pure Chern Simons matter theories, pure meaning without Yang Mills, which have n equals four, five, six and n equals eight in three dimensions. n equals eight is the maximal supersymmetry in three dimensions. So th these were developed by Kyoto and Witten and Hosomichi, Li, 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 Park. Um, there's some interesting theories with n equals five. And ones with sufficient amount of supersymmetry have been classified. So I'm gonna just tell you about the case with n equals six and n equals eight. Um, so there it's actually very easy to see where the supersymmetry enhancement arises. So I'm gonna tell you about a particular theory. So, oh, another thing to say, which is obvious from what I already said, but let me say it explicitly, which is that once you start talking about these chern simons matter theories with at least n equals three supersymmetry, because there are no tunable couplings in the Lagrangian, once you specify the gauge group, the chern simons levels, and the representations of the matter fields, you completely determine the theory, and so then you can just write down the action, and it's unique, and it's a super conformal theory with n equals three supersymmetry. So if I just tell you, you know, there are two gauge groups and these hypers that defines the theory, you can write down the action from those rules. So here I'm going to look at a particular theory. It's a UN times UN gauge theory with churn simons levels k and minus k, with two by fundamental hypermultiplets. So this is sort of in the n equals three language. In n equals two language, each of these by fundamental hypermultiplets consists of a conjugate pair of chiral by fundamentals. So in n equals two language, I would be writing a quiver diagram like this, where these double arrows mean I have two chiral fields, let's call them A1 and A2 in the NN bar representation and two chiral fields B1 and B2 in the N bar N representation. 
A1 and B1 fit together to make one of these hypers, and A2 and B2 to make the other one of these hypers. Now, yes? Uh, oh, you, you, you mean over here, or are you referring to this action? Yeah, that's one, um, it's just one phi. One phi. By phi, you mean the matter or the vector? Matter. Oh, uh, well, I put this index i to mean that there could be many of them, but... I, I suppose, oh, so what, 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 you're, what you're saying is that I should have written I on the T also, if I had several of them. I mean, it, okay, it's some notational issue. You could imagine putting all of the fields together into one, non, one reducible representation, for instance. So, yeah. yeah, so what I call, I mean, the phi's there are these A's and B's here. Right, so the, or so in this n equals three language there, these phi's, so one, one copy of phi and phi tilde on that blackboard would consist of A and B, and the other one would be A2 and B2. So now because this thing is an n equals three theory, it has at least an SU2R symmetry, and the, SU2, the SU2R symmetry acts on these chiral multiplets when I write the theory in the n equals two language so that I have one doublet which consists of a1, b1 dagger, and another doublet which is a2, b2 dagger. These are the full hypers that were appearing there that I call phi i, phi tilde i. So that's an SU2 R symmetry. But this theory has, is interesting if you just forget that it's a chern simons theory in three dimensions. This picture looks very similar to the klebanov witten theory in four dimensions, which turns out not to be a complete coincidence. But at this point, the only thing we want to note about that is that if you write down this superpotential in this particular example, you find the following. So you get four pi over k times this quantity, so this is given by the trace of A1, B1, A1, B1, plus A2, B2, A2, B2. Oh, so, sorry, I'm not writing this correctly. Uh, so, Right, so I, I just want to write down that formula in this particular case. So I have two fields, two fields of the sort phi. One of them I'm calling A and the other one I'm calling B. So the term, the first term, which is the sum over I of phi I tilde T A phi I is given by A1 B1 plus A2 B2. And the second term looks identical. So I just square it, so that's what I get associated to the first gauge group. And then I have a second gauge group, so I have another term of the same kind, but it has a turn sign as level of minus k, which gives me this minus sign. And then I get trace of B1 A1 plus B2, oops, B2 A2 squared. And it's very easy to work out what this is. All of the squared terms cancel, and I'm only left with a total of uh, eight pi over k, trace a1, b1, a2, b2, minus a1, b2, a2, b1, where I use the cyclicity of the trace to reorder the terms slightly. So obviously the term a1, b1 squared cancels with the term B1, A1 squared in the tres. And this is, in fact, exactly the superpotential of the klebanov witten theory. And it's well known that it has, which is a theory in four dimensions, but it's 
the same superdense, like the dimensional reduction plus some chern simons terms. And this thing has an SU2 times SU2 flavor symmetry. Now, this flavor symmetry is completely, acts in a very different way than that SU2R symmetry. The doublets of, under the, under the first SU2, A1, A2 sits in a doublet, and the Bs are neutral. And under the second SU2, B1, B2 sits in a doublet, and the As are neutral. You can see that this has this structure by writing this in terms of contractions with the epsilon tensor associated to SU2. So what happens when I have this SU2 cross SU2 and this SU2R symmetry? So when we think of the theory in this way, thinking of it as an N equals 2 theory, we're only imagining a U1R symmetry, but it actually has this whole SU2R symmetry. But it's clear that this SU2 action on which those are doublets doesn't commute with this SU2 action. So I can write it down more explicitly if I put the four guys, A1, A2, B1, and B2, into a four by four matrix, then I could write, for instance, um, A1, A2, B1 dagger, B2 dagger. That's my vector. Then this SU2 times SU2 flavor symmetry, well, one of these SU2s sits here, one of them sits here, and then the other one, the SU2R symmetry of the N equal, if you realize the theory has N equals 3 supersymmetry, rotates these two together. And so it's the other, the other generators, which when you put it all together, gives you an SU4R symmetry. But the supersymmetry is transformed non in a non-trivial representation of this SU2 here. And so they also have to sit in a complete representation of this group. And you can actually check explicitly that the rest of the supersymmetries do act on the theory, say if you write it all in components or in various ways. And so the, there turns out to be an N equals six supersymmetry. So this fits the pattern of the amount of the R symmetries that you get in three dimensions. This group is of course the same as spin six, if you like. So this is the vector representation of this SO6 uh, R symmetry. You could also tell that this had to be what it was if you think about the fact that the supersymmetry sit in the three of that SU2 in the way that that SU2 R symmetry gets embedded in this SU4. Okay, so this is a theory which has N equals six supersymmetry. If I added Yang-Mills kinetic terms to the theory, it would break it back to N equals three. If I added the Yang-Mills kinetic terms, then it would break this SU2 cross SU2 flavor symmetry, and I would be back to just this N equals three Yang-Mills turn Simons theory. So it's something, uh, it's something more delicate. And then there is a special case of this, which has even more supersymmetry. But th this theory with N equals six is the most supersymmetric theory which has arbitrary gauge groups, so ar arbitrary rank gauge group. So if you want a UN theory for some arbitrary N, and since we're going to be interested in ADS CFT, we really want to think about large N, then this is the most supersymmetric theory you can write down. It's the most supersymmetric Chen Simons theory in three dimensions. But if you chose the gauge group, and this is sort of an aside, but if you chose the gauge group to be SU2 times SU2, instead of rank N, you just take rank two and, and SU2, then the, these fields, the, the matter field, so just take the same theory, but with this special choice of the gauge group, then the matter fields will be sitting in the, in the two, two bar representation, but the two bar and the two representations of SU2 are the same, and so there is another way that you can rotate all of these A's and B's together. They sit, and, oh, is there a question? Yeah. So how restricted is this uh, choice of the Johnson levels? Uh, how restricted? Well, so, right, in order to get this theory to end up having N equals six supersymmetry, you needed to take them to be summing to zero, so K and minus K. If you took two K's that didn't sum to zero, 
then in this formula, I would have had here K1, and here I would have had K2, and then the terms that looked like A1, B1, all squared, wouldn't cancel, and I wouldn't have ended up with this form for the superintendent, I wouldn't have had this flavor symmetry. So I could do that, but I'll just have an N equals three theory in, in three dimensions. It won't enhance N equals six. Oh, a G2 gauge group, you mean? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure about G2 gauge group. I don't think so, but yeah. I th so I think these things were classified, and G2 doesn't appear on the list. Oh, no, but no, not, not the G2 gauge group. Uh, two gauge groups. Two oh, different two different gauge groups. Oh, I see. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Yeah, uh, no, so in general, that won't work. Um, if you, th th there are some, some versions of that, which will give you not n equals six, but n equals five supersymmetry, for instance. So if one of them is sp and the other is so, you'll end up with a theory with n equals five supersymmetry. But if there are two random gauge groups, then it won't work. If one of them is un and the other is um, then you still have n equals six. So it depends on precisely which groups you choose. Uh, basically because this, I mean, the reason why you had this enhancement is some very delicate feature of how this thing fit together. So, this derivation doesn't care if you take un and um, it goes through, so those all have n equals six. But if you chose other gauge groups, like sp gauge groups, it would have less. Right, so in this special choice of sc2 cross sc2, then all of the matter representations sit in the, in the same representation. In other words, the n n bar and the n bar n are, are all the same, because the two and the two bar are the same in sc2. So then there's a whole su4, that flavor symmetry of the superpotential. So then you have a, an SU4 flavor. If you think of this theory in n equals two notation, as we did there, and then there's still the SU2 R symmetry of this being an n equals three theory in three dimensions. And so then you end up getting an enhancement all the way up to a spin eight R symmetry, which is the smallest group that fits these two together in the right pattern. So this theory was actually written down by Bagger, Lambert, and Gustafsson, and it is the most supersymmetric Chen Simon's matter theory that, that you can write down. Um, but it, it's restricted to this, this rank two uh, example. Um, so okay, so we won't, we won't talk much more about this theory, but just since it's the most supersymmetric, uh, uh, it certainly deserves to be mentioned, and they, that was in fact the first John Simon's matter theory ever written down that had more than n equals three supersymmetry. So, and it certainly appears, obviously it's closely related to the theories that appear on M2 brains. I think it's fair to say that the precise M2 brain interpretation of this theory when at general k, like you say if k is five, is not known, but it probably exists. So it's an open problem. Okay, um, let's see how we're doing. Great, so now l let me tell you a couple of things about the moduli spaces of these theories. So in general, if I have a, say an n equals three or n equals two chance Hyman's matter theory, there could be a Higgs branch of the moduli space, by which I mean one in which the gauge groups are completely broken. The gauge groups are completely broken. The moduli space works by very similar rules to gauge series in four dimensions. You impose the F term condition, dW equals zero. You impose some D term condition, which as I explained on Friday is a cubic equation now. Um, but in the case when the gauge groups are completely broken, it turns out that it, it meets, so suppose I have an N equals two chern simons matter theory. We're talking about the moduli space. So one kind of equation is the F term equation, dW equals zero. But on the Higgs branch, when all gauge groups are broken, then the adjoint, the real adjoint field that sits in the n equals two vector multiplets must also all be set to zero. and A is again the gauge group index. This is kind of obvious because the sigmas have the same couplings to the matter fields as the gauge field. And so if 
The webs of the matter fields on the Higgs branch completely broke the gauge symmetry. They make all of the A's massive. They'll also make all the sigmas massive. And on the moduli space, you'd have to set sigma to zero. So then the cubic equation looks identical to the usual quadratic D-term equations you get in four dimensions. Sigma, remember in Chern Simon's theories, is set equal to the moment map, if you like, combination of the matter fields, which is precisely the D-term equation of a 4D gauge theory. So on this true Higgs branch, when all gauge groups are completely broken, it works just like n equals 1 theories in four dimensions. But we're actually mostly going to be interested in cases where you don't have a pure Higgs branch in this sense. Some of the parts of the gauge geometry remain unbroken, even when you turn on all of the matter fields. So let me give you a simple example. So here's, in, of course, in three, in three dimensions, it's, you don't only have Higgs and Coulomb branches, lots of mixed branches because of the Chen Simons terms. So I'm not sure what you call this branch in the modular series, it doesn't really have a name, but we're going to look at some very simple Chen Simons matter theory, say a U1 cross U1 theory at level k and minus k with ju just uh, one chiral multiplet in by fundamental and its conjugate. So half the matter content of this n equals 6 theory. This theory turns out, actually, in the pure Simon's theory, to be enhanced to n equals 4, but that won't be relevant for us. It's by some similar mechanism to which that enhances to n equals 6. Okay, so in this, in this Chern Simon's theory, the diagonal U1 is never broken because nothing is charged under it. The matter sits in the bifundamental representation. And so if I do the same rotation in both cage groups, it doesn't act on the matter fields at all. So it doesn't have a true Higgs branch in that sense. And so not all of the sigmas have to be set to zero. So the sigma associated to the broken part of the gauge symmetry, which is the off diagonal part, the relative U1, will be set to zero. But the other one doesn't have to be set to zero. OK, so what happens in this theory? Um, so first of all, if you work out what the superpotential is by these rules. So OK, I didn't tell you whether I wanted to think of this as n equals 2 theory or n equals 3 theory. So I, I imagine taking the n equals 3 theory with this content. So it's one by fundamental hypermultiplet. Uh, but because it's, so it has a similar superpotential to that. but. Because it's a U1 theory, it just cancels, and so the superpotential is just zero. Um, OK, so it's a very simple theory. The superpotential is zero, and so this condition tells you nothing. It's vacuous. And so I'm left, and if I call these fields, say, I don't know, A and B, similar to that, then A and B are just flat directions in the bosonic potential. It's easy to check this. So you might have thought that you should take a and B, which parameterize C2, and quotient it by the constant gauge symmetries. That's what you would have done on a usual Higgs branch. You would have set to zero the associated moment map. So if, if, I had, if this thing had been a 4D gauge theory, then I would have set to zero A dagger A minus BB dagger, or I would have set it equal to some FI parameter. That's, of course, that's saying that I set sigma to zero, but I don't have to do that here. I have some cubic equations, and sigma doesn't get set to zero. The equation says that sigma acting on the matter fields is zero. So I have two sigmas. I have sigma one, which is A dagger minus B dagger B, and I have sigma two, which is BB dagger minus a dagger A, of course, these are minus each other, but these guys are supposed to be multiplied, if you remember, by the inverse of the Chern Simons level. So if you go back to Friday's notes, then you'll see that the D term equation sets sigma equal to this combinations of the matter fields times 1 over the Chern Simons level. So you get here 1 over K, and here you get 1 over minus K. And so now these minus signs cancel. So sigma 1 is just equal to sigma 2. And then the moduli space equations, in addition to dw equals 0, which is a vacuous equation here, says that 
the sigmas acting on the matter fields give zero. So in other words, sigma acting on A, and then A is in the bifundamental representation, so sigma 2 acts with the opposite phase, minus sigma 2 acting on A has to be zero. But because sigma 1 and sigma 2 are equal, this equation is trivially satisfied, and similarly for the B. So it looks like the modular space is C2, but then you might have thought you should quotient by constant gauge transformations. In other words, I still have the relative U1, which acts non-trivially on A and B. It multiplies A by e to the i phi and B by e to the minus i phi. So you would have thought, from the intuition of finding the moduli spaces gauge in four dimensions, you quotient by constant gauge transformations. And then you would have ended up with a three-dimensional moduli space, which doesn't sound very supersymmetric. And it's definitely the wrong answer. So why does that happen? So there's something that we didn't take into account, which is that <coughs> in Chern Simons theories, the Chern Simons action is not gauge invariant exactly, it's invariant on up to total derivatives. And so if you look at configurations such as this, in which you, tr you try to look at constant gauge transformations, not all of them are actually symmetries of the theory. So, but the, th the fluxes are quantized, so if you, if you look at the flux of the two gauge groups on an S2, for instance, or really on, a on any two cycle, then they'll be quantized two pi times some integers. Now, in, in this particular theory, in this particular theory, there's no matter charged under the, so, there's no matter charged under the diagonal combination of these two U1s. And so the equation of motion for that gauge field just sets to zero the flux of the other one. In other words, if I wrote down these turn Simons terms, I have K integral A1 wedge DA1 minus A2 wedge DA2, and then the couplings of the Turn Simon's gauge field to these matter fields. But you can see that if I rewrite this in terms of a plus and minus given by the sum and difference of the two of them, this thing is just given by the so fully off diagonal combination. It's k over 2 pi a um, plus wedge d a minus. And A minus is the only gauge field which couples to the matter because they're only charged under the relative U1. And so the equation of motion for A plus just sets to zero D A minus. So it just says that there's no A minus flux at all. So if I look here, really in the theory, I have to have that N2 is equal to N1 by the equations of motion. Or if you like, by gauge invariance. If you didn't have this flux, you wouldn't satisfy the Gauss's law associated to the gauge field A plus. But there's nothing that says that N1 equal to N2 has to be zero because you have the matter fields and so the equation of motion for A minus doesn't set the A plus flux to zero, it just sets it equal to something related to the matter current. So you can have such flux configurations and so therefore the Chern Simons term is not invariant, not even up to Z2 shifts under um, so, under all constant gauge transformations, only some discrete subgroup of the constant gauge transformations is left unbroken, or is, is actually a symmetry of the action, I should say. Oops. Right, so if I, if I look at the, so suppose I do a constant gauge transformation, then the change in the Chern Simons action is given by k over 4 pi times twice lambda 1. So the Chern Simons action is like this. If I do a gauge transformation which shifts this thing by d lambda, and then I integrate by parts, so I get lambda times, well, I mean, if. Maybe I should write it down. So, okay, so I want to do a gauge transformation on the Chern Simons term. 
a wedge dA and I send a to a plus d lambda, then this thing, of course, changes by twice d lambda wedge dA. But let's suppose this thing was on a space like S2 cross R. Then if I did a constant gauge transformation so that lambda is a constant, it, of course, doesn't do nothing, but it changes this thing by twice lambda. I, I just pick up the boundary integral. This thing is a total derivative, so I can rewrite this like this. And so I pick up the boundary integral, which is the integral on S2 of lambda times dA, if lambda is a constant. But the integral on S2 of dA is just the flux, which we said was quantized in that way. So we get this thing times 2 pi n minus k over 4 pi, because the other one has transcendence level minus k, lambda 2, 2 pi n, because the two fluxes are equal. And this thing is given by k n times lambda 1 minus lambda 2. So this thing is only an integer, which is necessary so that e to the 2 pi i s Simons is well defined if lambda 1 minus lambda 2 is also an integer. So n is any integer. So if this whole thing has to be an integer for any integer n, so that means that this thing must be 1 over k times an integer. So it could be an integer, or it could be 1 over k, or it could be 3 over k. So lambda 1 minus lambda 2 is contained in 1 over k times an integer. OK, so you're not supposed to quotient by all constant gauge transformations, which is the supersymmetric partner, if you like, of the statement that you don't have to set all the sigmas to 0. You only quotient by this discrete subgroup. And so you end up taking this C2 and modding it out by ZK. So these gauge transformations act on the matter fields by e to the i lambda 1 minus lambda 2 and e to the minus times 2 pi. So if I have something like that, then the action on these fields is it multiplies this thing by e to the 2 pi i over k, and it multiplies this by e to the minus 2 pi i over k in general, and et cetera. So I end up with C2 mod ZK. OK, now th there's actually another way that you can see that that's the right answer, which is that if you go out onto the moduli space, so you give some vacuum expectation value to A or B, then the off-diagonal component of the gauge group gets hexed. It becomes massive. And then, as usual, you can try to integrate it out. And when you do that, you end up generating Yang-Mills kinetic terms for the diagonal component of the gauge group. And so then you can dualize it to and find the dual photon. And the dual photon is charged under the off-diagonal, the relative U1, under which the matter fields are charged. And so when you want to find the moduli space, you want to gauge fix, you have to set this dual photon to zero, and that already fixes the gauge symmetry up to this residual ZK uh, piece. So you can derive the same answer in that way. A slightly different way of saying the same thing is that in the abelian theories, when you couple to a churn simons term, the currents which you gauged the current which you gauge in this gauge group is the matter current plus k times the topological current of the first gauge group. And here you gauge minus the matter current minus k times j topological of the second gauge group, minus the matter current because the fields are in the bifundamental. But if I gauge these two things, I have never actually gauged the matter current itself. So one combination of these is the sum, which is just the difference of the two topological currents. And the other one is I, I know, something like this. And so what this is saying, so once I go out onto the moduli space, I break the relative U1, which is the one who's associated to J1 top minus J2 top. That one's broken, so I don't have to worry about whether I gauge the symmetry or not. It's broken on the moduli space. The one that's left is the sum of the two gauge fields, the A1 plus. As I said, that gets yang mills kinetic terms. And its dual photon is, of course, charged because of, I mean, 
the topological current is precisely the shifts of the dual photon. And so the thing I'm actually gauging is the matter current plus k times that. So if I gauge shift by setting it to zero, I still have this residual zk, but otherwise I don't actually quotient the moduli space parameterized by VEVs of the chiral multiplets by the whole U1 gauge symmetry. Okay, so the Oh, I think I said this on Friday. I mean, I can remind them. I mean, the topological current is just star of the gauge field, so star, star F is this current. I mean, this is a conserved current by the Bianchi identity. So D star J is given by D star star F, which is DF, which is trivially zero because F is DA. So that's a current which is always conserved in these three-dimensional gauge theories. And th there are objects which are charged under this topological current, which are called uh, Abrakosov vortices. Um, Sometimes they're also called monopole operators for a reason that will become apparent. So we won't delve too deeply into the subject of these vortices, but it's something that's special in three dimensions. So even in, so th th these things you have in Yang Mills in three dimensions and, and in Chern Simons theory. So in, say, n equals two Yang Mills or n equals two Chern Simons theory, you can have such vortices which are in fact, half BPS. Um, so in, in general, uh, such a half BPS vortex satisfies the Bogomonyi equation. F is given by star d sigma. So sigma is, again, that same scalar that sits in the n equals 2 vector multiplet. So you can have some configuration like this, um, where sigma, so this is some configuration in, in R21, where sigma is given by some vortex number n over 2r. So there's some radio profile for this field sigma, which has a singularity at the origin. And if you define f in this way, well, it certainly, you can check that it satisfies the equations of motion, but it's also invariant under n equals 2 supersymmetry in the case of Yang-Mills theory. This guy, this equation is very similar to the equation that's describes monopole operators in four dimensions. But in, in four dimensions, of course, this is just the spatial piece, if you like. So these, so you can think of this vortex. Uh, so this vortex is literally something you could see in like in two dimensional theory. There's some point where the vortex is located and it moves around. That's sort of the particle description. You can also imagine an operator which creates the vortex. And the operator has a, profile which is very similar to the spatial profile of a monopole in four dimensions. Uh, but here, the, the operator which creates you think of in Euclidean three dimensions, so there's some relation. Maybe you could you call it instanton operator, perhaps. But so in order to describe these vortices um, more clearly in the quantum theory, uh, uh, yes? Sorry? C2 quotient by ZK. Oh, I haven't. No, no. So th this, was, this was a simpler example. This is a theory with half the number of matter fields. I only had one bifundamental and one anti bifundamental. The, the, that theory has twice it. So, of course, that would be C4 mod ZK. Yeah, that's all. I just did this just to keep the notation simpler. Of, of course, in that case, everything is exactly the same. Um, so, in a conformal field theory in three dimensions, just like it, I'm sure you're familiar in conformal field theories in two dimensions, there's a state operator correspondence so that states of the theory on a sphere correspond to operators inserted at a point. So one direction of the correspondence is obvious. If I take an operator and I insert it at a point and I put a sphere around it and think of the theory in radial quantization, it defines some state. Um, 
The other direction, well, is just the inverse of that operation. So there's a correspondence between local operators inserted at a point and states in the radio quantization of the theory on the sphere. So if we want to understand what operator in the quantum theory can create one of these vortices, you should think in this way. So in order to do that, it's natural to take the theory, to consider the theory on, on S2 cross R. Th this really means in Euclidean space. You should think of the R as a radial time. And so I have to do some conformal transformation to get from flat space to S2 times R. And when I follow through the supersymmetry algebra, the supersymmetry generators no longer commute with the Hamiltonian associated to this radial direction. They don't commute with the radial Hamiltonian. This fact shouldn't be too surprising because the radial Hamiltonian is, in the original picture, the dilatation operator. I mean, you should think the picture you should have in mind is like this. Here's S2 and here's the R. It's like the radial direction. And so the radial time is like the dilatation operator, the conformal transformation of the original theory, which doesn't commute with the supersymmetries. They fit together into the more complicated superconformal algebra. So you have some relation like this. And because of that, the dimensions of operators, are, well, because of that, you, you have to change, I mean, the, the effective dimensions of operators is different when you work on S2 cross R. And so instead of having an equation of this form, which relates F to star of D sigma, the background you get on the sphere is much simpler. It's just sigma is equal to n over 2, just a constant. Now, the reason why this thing, I'm calling it a, a, this is some kind of magnetic vortex. If you work out what the integral of f around some sphere is, it gives you the number n over 2. So this is a kind of vortex which carries n units of, of magnetic flux. And so when I do this conformal transformation to the sphere, I end up with uh, some constant uh, flux f on the sphere, which integrates to 2 pi n. So the picture is that I have some operator, which I insert at a point. Just confused. Is this, this r the radial operator? Yeah. Oh yeah, that, that R is on the plane. I mean, this is supposed to be, yeah, this is just an R in two dimensions. And then, right, this is supposed to be sort of the time-dependent vortex localized at a point. Right? Um, am I saying something wrong here? Um, What, what do you think should go here? I think it is not really anticipated, so it is in between the Sorry, say again? Oh, so just be, the, it's in Euclidean space, you're saying, the, the whole, uh, the whole, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's right, yeah, yeah, you're, you're, you're right, you're right. Um, yeah, okay, um, so, okay, I should, or maybe I should call it an instant or something. Yeah. So. Yeah, this is an this is like an instant on at a point. Okay, so this R I should is the whole space time R then. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. So now the integral on the sphere surrounding it is given by by two pi n. Okay, but the associated operator will create a vortex. So. Yeah, so, okay, um, so in, in, I haven't to, okay, okay um, let's see, do I want to, So 
so l l let me be slightly sketchy here. Um, if I may come back to this point a little later. In, in the transcendence theory, in principle, I should now solve the equations of motion for the whole transcendence, the whole transcendence theory, which are more complicated than these uh, simple equations you get in the case of Yang Mills theory or QED in three dimensions. But it turns out you can do a kind of trick if you imagine regulating the transcendence theory by adding back the Yang Mills term. So now I have a Yang Mills transcendence matter theory. Then near the near the insertion of the operator, you're only interested in the short distance physics, which is dominated by the Yang-Mills term, which is, makes the theory free at short distances. And so you can apply this, the same analysis that you do in the Yang-Mills case, even when you have the Trans-Hymas term, except that the whole operator you construct in that manner won't be gauge invariant. It will be charged under the gauge groups just because of a very similar argument to that. So under a gauge transformation, the churn simons action in such a background with one of these monopoles will change by four pi, k over four pi, two times d lambda wedge f. But now I'm integrating this over S2 cross R, and I just pick up k times the instanton number n times the integral of d lambda with respect to r. So this is exactly the coupling of a charged particle of charge k times n to the gauge field. So you can construct these monopoles, but they have charge k n. So the minimal one with one unit of magnetic flux has charge k. Um, th th these operators are well known in the study of, say, quantum Hall effect in condensed matter physics. And in these supersymmetric theories, you can find operators, I mean, of this form, which are half BPS. So let me try now to get to the discussion of M2 brains. So if we need to use some further properties of these monopole operators, I might get back to them. In principle, there are interesting quantum corrections, but that goes beyond the scope of these three lectures, unfortunately. The monopole operator itself um, right, so in, in order to make just to clarify what I said there, so th this monopole operator is like a charged particle with charge k in order to make gauge invariant combinations, it has to be combined with the matter field, so you, it effectively functions like a l insertion of a local field which transforms non-trivially under the gauge group, and so you have to combine it together in gauge invariant combinations. Of course, it's actually not a local field in the usual sense. It's some non-perturbative object. It's non-perturbative because you can see that it's, for instance, the charge becomes very large when the theory is weakly coupled. So one over k is like the coupling. When k is large, the thing has a huge charge, and if you try to form a gauge invariant combination, you'll have to use k of the matter fields in combination with it, and so it will have a huge dimension. And so we coupling these things decouple from the theory. But they're very important when, say, k is 1 or k is some fixed number. OK, so I'm going to start now talking about a kind of different topic, namely about the gravity side and M2 brands. So if there are any other questions about the field theory. Yeah? Sorry, I'm not sure if I understood the question. What? In n equals 4, d equals 4, for example, why don't we talk about instanton operators in radial quantization? Um, well, you, I, I mean, th those operators, when you, you know, match the, when we check the Yeah, yeah, oh, oh, I see. I mean, well, so in, in four dimensions, you don't have these kind of operators because in four dimensions, what you would want to find is an operator inserted at a point so that the integral around S3 of some, some flux was unequal to zero. But in four-dimensional gauge theories, you don't have this flux, this three-form flux. It would have to be not a four-dimensional gauge theory, 
with a four-dimensional theory involving some two-form potential, so that the flux was a three-form and could be non-trivial, have some non-trivial topological configuration on S3. That's true, an instant on one have non-trivial fluxes on S3. But, so the story in four dimensions, therefore, is, is different, and you wouldn't, I mean, in four dimensions, you don't have this kind of topological disorder instantons, if you like, so. So you don't talk about them because you don't have them. Right, I mean, in, in, of course, you have instantons in four dimensions, but you think of them as instantons, right? They contribute to, you know, you sum over them in a partition function, there's some configurations like that. They don't, they're not operators which create some object which you put in the chiral ring of the theory, for instance. Okay, sure. Sure, you, you can do that. You can do that here as well. Well, so its meaning in the field theory is, is the same. I mean, you could introduce f high parameters, and Th that's certainly true. Yes. Yeah, you can preserve the full. In, in fact, in the theory with n equals six supersymmetry, you also have its C four mod zk, and you can also smooth that singularity by adding some kinds of of f high parameters. The, the story is sometimes so somewhat different in in these three-dimensional theories, because if you, if you add the fi parameters, say, in this theory, then you, you don't smooth the moduli space. So some, sometimes you can smooth the moduli space in the same way, and sometimes with this kind of moduli space, you end up getting just discrete vacua. So if you, if you try to add the same fi parameter to the two gauge groups, so usually in four dimensions, you'd have the sums of the fi parameters to be zero. Basically, if you do that here, you can actually shift it away because of the chern simons coupling. Um, but if you add unequal ones, then you can't shift it away, but it lifts the, lifts the moduli space and leaves you discrete vacua. So the story is sometimes different. If you have something that's more like a pure Higgs branch, then you can resolve it in exactly the same way. So d different possibilities. Oh, yes? Sure, uh, if we have time uh, tomorrow, I might get to this, or some, some version of this. Okay, so now I'm gonna tell you some things about M2 brains and D2 brains. So, so in type 2A string theory, you have, uh, you have various D brains, you have some, some D2 brains, which have, uh, just to remind you some basic things, so they have a tension which goes like one over GS L string cube, they have a, a coupling to the A3 flux, I mean to the A3 potential, which is associated to the four form flux in type 2A theory. So the coupling is just the integral of this on the D2 world volume. If you have a stack of N D2 brands in type 2A, in 10 dimensional supergravity, I can surround it by a big S6 and compute the integral on S6 of star F4, and this gives for me the number of the D2 brains that I surround. So they source this, they couple to this four form flux. Yeah, so how much time, when should I go until actually? Do I have 15 more minutes because I started late or? About 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. Okay, so in type 2A theory, if I have a stack of a large number of D2 brains, then it's described by some black brain supergravity background. So I have some metric of this form, which is just the special case of the black, uh, black D brain metric to D2 brains. So x1 and x2 are the directions along the D2 brain, and the other ones are the transverse directions. This function is 
This function f is given by a usual warp factor. C2 is some constant that I won't bother to write down. OK, so I get a metric like this. So this is similar to the black hole Schwarzschild metric, but for a black two brain in 10 dimensions. And this solution has, in addition, a varying dilaton and, of course, carries the four form flux under which the D2 brain is charged. So I also have the three form potential in the 0, 1, 2 directions given by 1 half of 1 minus f inverse. That if I, I mean, d of this is a four form flux which goes, spreads in space time. And if you compute the integral of star of the associated four form flux, you'll count the number n, which is the number of the two brains that source the flux. And there's also a dilaton which is varying by the GS at r equals infinity multiplied by this same function f. And so the horizon is located at r equals zero, spatial infinity is r goes to infinity, and you see that as r goes to zero, this function f diverges, the string coupling goes to infinity. As r goes to zero, and you don't have a, a smooth near horizon geometry. So on the D2 brain, there is some gauge theory. Um, so the, the gauge fields on the D2 are the n equals 8 super Yang mills in three dimensions. And you can think of this as the dimensional reduction of the n equals 4 theory in four dimensions down to n equals 2. Um, so it's maximally supersymmetric UN uh, super Yang Mills theory in three dimensions. And it has the uh, Yang Mills coupling, which is related to um, related to the string coupling in this background. But in three dimensions, this is a dimensionful coupling, as we discussed many times. And the effective, effective dimensionless coupling of this Yang-Mills theory is, is actually given by this J Yang-Mills squared n divided by, <coughs> excuse me, r alpha prime. So it depends on the distance as you go towards the black hole. So as usual, the distance from the horizon sets the energy scale associated to this field theory. And because the coupling is dimensionful, as you get very close to the horizon, it's like you flow in the field theory to the infrared, and the effective coupling of the yang mills theory becomes very large. OK, and th there's no smooth near horizon on that. In, in in type 2a supergravity. So you could try to write one down blindly, but you'll end up with some singular geometry. You'll have you know, this part of f appearing in it in ways which diverge when you try to take the limit. Unlike, say, the near horizon limit of d3, d3 brains, which gives you ADS5 cross S5. On the other hand, the string coupling is getting large. And so that suggests that because we started in type 2a theory, when the coupling grows large, it's natural to lift to m theory. And when you lift to m theory, we'll find that there is a smooth near horizon limit. So right, so, so it, as we get near to this black D2 brain, the string coupling gets large, so 
So we lift to M theory, the D2 brain lifts to the M2 brain, and we write down instead a black brain solution in 11 dimensional supergravity. So this is the black M2 brain solution. Where, again, there's some warp function f. Maybe I should have given it a different name, but in the context, I think it's clear. Sorry, this is illegible. Okay, d omega 7 squared. So now the d2 brain is surrounded by a 7 sphere on which you would integrate star of f4. So it's still a background with four form flux. And this warp factor is given by something with slightly different dependence. 1 over r cubed. And as before, there's the same amount of four-form flux. So you measure, measure n units of four-form flux at a sphere at infinity. Okay, now this black M2 brain geometry does have a smooth near horizon, and the, the near horizon geometry looks like ADS4 cross S7, and now there are just n, n units of the four form flux threading ADS4. And of course, we're in M theory now, so there's no adjustable coupling, and you have this nice, very symmetric solution. So, ADS4 times F7, the radius of the ADS4 is given by, in 11-dimensional Planck, Planck units, by something of order n to the 1 -sixth power. And, of course, this thing has an isometry, SO32 times SO8. The SO8 is the SO8R symmetry of the field theory. The SO32 is the conformal symmetry of the uh, three-dimensional CFT that you get in the infrared. Of course, there's also, this background is also supersymmetric, and in the field theory, this is enhanced to the full super N equals 8 superconformal algebra. Okay, now, on the other hand, the decoupling limit of the D2 brains, so, as I said, the, if you could decouple the D2 brain field theory from gravity, like you do in four dimensions, where you go to the near horizon limit corresponds to the decoupling limit of the n equals 4 super Yang mills that lives on D3 brains from the supergravity background, then it would be, for D2 brains, it would be described by the n equals 8 super Yang mills. And the n equals 8 Yang mills has a spin 7 R symmetry in which the 8 supersymmetries are in the spinner representation of the spin 7, and then there are seven real adjoint scalars in the vector. So what are these scalars? So if I think about the n equals eight super Yang mills in n equals, in 3D n equals four language, it looks like I have a UN gauge group with, with, which means an n equals four Yang Mills vector coupled to a single adjoint hyper. If I thought of the same thing in n equals two language, I'd say I have an n equals two vector and six adjoint chirals. So why is that? So the n equals four vector has an n equals two vector and one adjoint chiral. An adjoint hyper has a pair of 
adjoint chirals. So that gives me a total of three. So in the n equals three language, I would say that this theory has a superpotential, which is given by Jiang Mills times trace of phi one commutator phi two phi three. That's the n equals four. That's the superpotential of an, this n equals four theory written in n equals two language. But this thing actually has the full n equals eight. The seven real scalars, if I count them, say here. Each of these adjoint chirals is a complex field, so it has two real scalars. And then there's one real scalar in the n equals two vector multiplet, so there's a total of seven, which transform in the vector of this spin seven R symmetry. So it looks like I have run out of time for today. So uh, tomorrow, I'm gonna finish telling you about this n equals eight Yang Mills theory and how it relates to the n equals six Chen Simons matter theory. And then I'll describe to you the the holographic dual of that realization. So I'll tell you more about this ADS4 times S7 and also the dual to the N equals six Chern Simons theory at large K, which will be a certain type 2A background. And maybe we'll get a little bit to brain constructions at the end. <laughs>